Yeah, did that work? Yes, I'm recording now. Okay, great. Well, I might maybe I start from the beginning. <laughs> My name is Amy, and I'm really excited to, to share with you um, you all creative uses of neuroscience data from our perspective, this perspective of EDGE, um, the registered association. And um, today, I think I'd like to introduce these topics to you, a little bit about what EDGE is, who I am, who we are, um, sort of why we think data needs to be communicated, but also effectively unpackaged, and how this motivates us to do immersive, interactive, interdisciplinary art, uh, what's possible out in the world, but actually, you know, we make it our business to come into contact with as many artists, scientists, interested people, um, to link them for collaboration. So it's really no surprise that we've come across some amazing projects. Over our three short years, we've um, worked with over 50 artists. And so um, I've just selected about eight or so to introduce some um, different methods of neuroscience data collection that have been used um, in an artistic and creative way. Um, so actually we're going to focus mostly on examples close to home. Um, and then we'll have a little digital speed meeting if the breakout rooms work. Um, this is always an important part of our workshops and community building activities. Um, and then a little bit how to get involved um, if you're still interested and there's still people hanging on at the end. Uh, I have to put a little disclaimer and that is um, I get very passionate about this and when I get passionate I talk very quickly and usually in a workshop you can see people going oh um, but I can't see that so maybe you could put your hand up or or wave I actually can't see the chat when I'm in this presenter view so um, maybe someone will have to verbally slow me down or stop me please questions at any point that would be great and yeah hopefully by the end of this I will have convinced you that you are all amazing creative artists and that you have something to offer the art world that the whole world needs to see um, so yeah, let's get stuck in with sort of who are we, who is EDGE, um, and uh, yeah, so we're kind of at the intersection between research labs, um, institutes, scientists, artists, and the public, or everybody else, the people I like to call the neuro-curious, and um, I think using art to communicate cutting edge science kind of does require interdisciplinary approaches. We've heard a lot about multimodal um, data collection and, and interdisciplinary um, science here uh, to the, in the last, I guess, yesterday and today, amazing talks. Um, but yeah, we, EDGE does this and by fostering this community of, of um, very diverse people. Um, and so we like to have a networking platform as well as encouraging uh, you know, exchange and discussion. And our goal is to have this rich and communicative and open um, uh, platform and community that is also critical and challenging. Um, and how do we do this? Well, we have our exhibitions annually. We have monthly workshops on creativity and science. We consult for events and um, uh, conferences and community building things. I guess hopefully this is one of those as well. Um, yeah, so there's four core organizers, of which I'm the, this one, I don't know if you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor? Yes. Um, you've got Ian, myself, Tatiana, Coco, this is in the CCO during the exhibition last year. Um, Tatiana and I studied together um, in 2000 and, um, at the Medical Neurosciences Program, and in 2018, along with Ian, we decided to put on our first exhibition after talking to many of our peers um, from the Medical Neurosciences Program and realizing actually everyone was really talented in, in artistic pursuits as well. Either they wanted to be a photographer or as a, as a professional painter on the side. And we just thought, you know, as an international student, sometimes it's really difficult to find your niche um, in a new city. And we thought this would be an amazing way to get to blend the interests and get, you know, neuroscience and arts together. And so initially it just started out as almost a student showcase and you can see some pieces here and, and maybe some familiar faces. Um, and it was at a biohacking lab, um, super cool place in, in Neukölln. Um, and then we kind of realized that it was so much more than that. You know, when we put it on, you know, every person, every pair we were talking um, to or walking past were sort of um, philosophizing or talking about consciousness and discussing their theory, discussing methods. And we realized that actually this was a really great way to engage with other scientists and members of the public. So it kind of started with this student showcase and then grew. And so we started doing um, 
workshops, which I'll talk about in a second, but um, with the help of Coco, who then came on board in 2019, we did the annual exhibition again, and we had more artists involved this time, you know, growing our community. Uh, you can see there was a, little, a few more artists, and um, yeah, we also split it up into two locations. This sort of two locations thing is quite important for us. Um, we are also doing it again this year, um, where we'll be at you know, last year we had it at CCO in the Charité and, and a decommissioned power plant to sort of the polar opposites in a way of this sort of artsy world and the this, this science clinical world. And again, we're doing that this year and it's actually starting in um, on Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Mind Foundation, which is a, um, a foundation for psychedelic research and science in um, Friedrichshain. And we'll also have four days at Altamünde, which is a former coin mint. And there's more artists and scientists there so um yeah we also we we have these workshops as i mentioned as well um this is a lot of text and i apologize but i just put it all on all of the the workshops that we've done sort of monthly um and maybe you've some things catch your eye so we've had you know theater and the neuroscience of empathy we've had film screenings we've had dance therapy we've had doi microscope building and we're super open to if anybody wants to contribute or has an idea of creativity and neuroscience. Um, we'd love to talk and, and put on uh, things. As you can see also during the lockdown, we didn't slow down. We also um, did a lot of uh, workshops online, which is something that we're quite interested in, like, like this event as well, I suppose. So um, yeah, we, we couldn't really get where we are without these amazing collaborators, some familiar faces there as well, I can imagine. Um, yeah. and always looking for, for more connections and collaborations as well. Um, so yeah, let's just jump straight into the next part. Um, so that's a little bit about EDGE and yeah, I'll put my contact details at the end um, if for any more information. So, you know, what's the problem or rather, why do we need to be creative with the data that we, that we make? And I guess I wanna start off this uh, discussion with two stories. We are creatures of narrative after all um, and I think as scientists it's it's quite sensible to prepare answers to the questions that you get all the time and this is one that I personally get quite a lot like do we really only use 10% of our brain and um, so I was thinking about this and I kind of realized that I actually have no idea where this information comes from <laughs> like um, of what you know sodium potassium ATPAs or you know what, what's this 10% and the idea is that it's you know humans have so much capacity left to reach. So the fact that we only use 10%, you know, it must come from some measured, you know, data collection, hopefully. Um, and so the only way to get into it is kind of to understand where it comes from and then and think about, yeah, maybe the analysis or I don't know, embed the technical details, which kind of enrich the story and the message. And actually, one of the people who's credited with this finding is um, Wilder Penfield, maybe some of you know him. Um, in mid 20th century. So he was pioneering a technique for the treatment of um, severe epilepsy, uh, which required damaging brain areas um, responsible for seizures. And just to make sure that he wasn't damaging, uh, you know, important areas, he devised sort of a stimulation, like a set of stimulations. And um, parts of the areas that he was stimulating during the open brain surgery, the awake operations, um, didn't seem to have an effect on the the operatee, the person being operated, the, uh, the patient. Um, and some of them did, you know, in the most extreme example, supposedly there was a woman who was um, experiencing a Royal Albert Hall concert because she was experiencing such extreme hallucinations, potentially because he was stimulating some part in the sensory cortex. Um, so he then decided that some of it's silent and some in this time, some of it's silent and some of it's not, and only a fraction of, of the brain had noticeable effects during these surgeries, hence the 10%, I can imagine. I guess he never actually said 10%. So data collection and how this information was acquired kind of busts this myth of the 10%. But he made these beautiful illustrations, um, which one you can see here, and maybe you might recognize and have formed the basis of the homunculus. I think people have seen that. Um, so kind of similarly along this vein, um, thinking about drawings and public perception, um, the world first experienced neurons, you know, neuroscience, I don't know, maybe, yeah. And neurons, neuroscience, and kind of saw their minds, their brain through the body of this man. I think that's super interesting that like, the, yeah, his hand created our public perception of what the neur neuron looked like initially. And, you know, his data and yeah, the representation of that, um, 
I think there's a German word gestalt. I don't know. It's like the shape of something. And I, I just really like that word. Um, so yeah, he, he was allowing people to experience the parameters of his data and, and the understanding kind of takes shape there. Um, for example, like understanding what a bold signal is, you can understand, you know, how exactly much we know about the brain and let people experience it. And that's why we as EDGE, yeah, um, you know, we want our exhibitions and our events to, to be this, to like, to change the shape of, of neuroscience for the public and for, for everybody involved, for artists, so that people can interface with it. Um, so how far has art and neuroscience come since then? Like what's going on now? Well, actually loads. <laughs> um, and perhaps it's confirmation bias. Um, yeah, but I would say that it's growing more um, because I think there's more, uh, money in public outreach hopefully and neuroscience as we all know is an amazingly broad field and I definitely could have done this talk about all of the crazy things that are happening all over the world but in my opinion so much of that is happening on our doorsteps and at the risk of making minor celebrities of your colleagues um, which I think they should be because it's amazing that they're doing all of this beautiful work um, alongside their research uh, but yeah is anybody out there collecting histology data um, microanatomy, maybe you've seen this guy, Christian Ebner. Um, 2019, he did an exhibition. Uh, he did a, um, so yeah, now for a couple of minutes, I'm just going to go into examples, um, these eight examples of data collection and the beautiful artwork that's coming out of those. So yeah, Christian did this incredible digital piece in 2019, and he also has a piece in the upcoming exhibition on Thursday. Um, so he provided me with this uh, figure, which is super nice. Um, also on the other page uh, with all of the um, newspaper articles, I have all of those links and all of the um, references. If anybody's interested, I can send them uh, to them. But anyway, back to this slide. Um, so yeah, during the recording on the left, biocytin is introduced um, by a perfect solution and biocytin is not visible. Uh, itself this marker molecule and then there's two staining methods that he used to create this digital painting here down uh, down here on the on the right with the neural grove and this one has a little bit more um, resolution because of the confocal microscopy and the streptovidin um yeah and then he's created this amazing piece and then taken it a single step further and also done 3D etching. Um, this is a sculpture, which I think he actually used as a trophy initially. And then, um, then but these will also be a, for, for a science award within the lab. Um, but yes, these will be visible in the upcoming exhibition. Um, yeah, staying on the theme for uh, microanatomy for these next artists, Yi Jen and Amna Siddiqui are researchers who created this joint piece, which is um, yeah, these microanatomy um, microscopy images of microglia in yellow and, and then a poem as well. And this was in the 2018 exhibition that EDGE did. And then we EDGE curated a uh, symposium a couple of weeks ago, which was this was then displayed at again. And, um, this is one of the pictures. I think it looks like this. I mean, this is the first thing that most people say. It looks like a galaxy of this ramified microglia. And then you have this beautiful poem by Anna. I can send it around at her um, uh, request if you, anybody wants to see that. And I think this is coming a little bit back to the concept of Gestalt because, you know, everybody knows about a neuron and neuroscience and but microglia also have an incredibly important role within the brain. And I think pieces like this really go to show just how ubiquitous they are in the brain as the brain's immune system. And, um, you know, coming back to the concept of the gestalt, um, changing the perception of, of what's important and what's relevant um, when uh, within our, ourselves, I guess, in our brain. And another point that I wanted to make with this is that, um, a lot of labs do operate behind a paywall and I do hope that we're going towards an open science community, but art does provide a way in which that you can share abstract images and tell the story without, um, you know, copyright or without, um, yeah, there's a lot of confidentiality, especially with patient, patient data and having like an abstract art piece does give you the platform to be able to share these uh, sometimes with discretion. Um, so this next topic I want to start approaching is, is huge. 
and, um, and it's growing thanks to readily available devices. And I wanted to bring it in with an artist who's bridging the gap between this sort of structural data. And um, so, oh, I didn't make this bigger. I don't know if you can see this. This is actually, oh, it's probably quite small on your screens. I apologize. This is a hand-blown glass cell body that was modeled off um, a pyramidal cell um, soma and it's called soma and then she made um soma lab and i think ashley is just incredible at um pulling a multidisciplinary team together she's from the artistic side really and is now learning neuroscience in order to go from this like structural information and then transferring all of what she's learned um which has been a lot i think the, the progress that she's she's undergone to um put something into the exhibition on uh, th uh, on Thursday and then it will be in the second part as well and this is um, yeah brain computer interface BCI and uh, she um, yeah this piece is called Insula and uh, she's working with a multidisciplinary team as I said and it's going to be live data like um, streamed from two to four EEG sensors over the parietal occipital lobes um, and participants will be able to interact with these developing somatic technologies I guess that's what BCI is um, and integrate like your biological data as well as light and sound um, to yeah experience neural networks and um, yeah I think it's it's going to be really interesting uh, there's a lot I think yeah as I said due to the readily available uh, devices she's using emotive and I can't remember um, what this next team are using but they have a couple more channels added on this this is going to be um, it's called reafference and um, with a team from Leipzig and this is also going to be in the second part of the exhibition and it will be electrocortical recordings um, BCI based on left and right um, motor imagery and so you can alter some sound and visuals with either becoming in going into more of a meditative state that after a training period um, the algorithm will pick up and then you'll be able to, to alter the, the artwork itself. And then on top of that, they're also going to have a performance, a dance performance alongside um, that will be sort of codified the, the frequency bands and so movement coded frequency bands and then um, uh, this, this amazing performance. So not one to miss. I think it's going to be really exciting. Something to say though, I've actually never seen it and um, and this actually does happen quite a lot with the, our curational, because everybody's, you know, making it as they, uh, as they apply and it's all very like dependent on what's available. And so a lot of the, uh, the, the technologies are new and also what they're doing is new. And so when they, when it appears in our exhibitions, it's the first time that we've seen it. And not to say that the aesthetics don't matter. I think it's really important as well, but with us, the neuroscience drives the creativity. And when the creativity or where the idea gets lost, the neuroscience picks it up again. And I think that uh, because the, the story is so rich and like everybody has to basically submit an essay when they apply, um, the, the technical details are really there. And I think like, you know, even just this story and how it's made and everything is just is so interesting. So um, yeah, it's a picture of one of the performers. I think, and you can see I'm putting the gel EG. We do have somewhere to wash our hair, so don't worry about it. Um, yes, so uh, where are we now? Yes. So just one more point about this, I guess. We, we also had a team from um, Amsterdam come to do quite a similar thing in a way. I mean, I think they were using completely different frequency bands. They were focusing on theta. And this was um, a performance called Vincula that was at the Mind Symposium on Bewusstseinskultur um, that was uh, in like last, it was the last month. Yeah, consciousness culture. And there was somebody sitting in the audience with um, a headset on and, but nobody else could see them because the, the, the room was dark and it was the dancers who had codified their, like, the, their, their movement again to theta waves. Um, and the, light and sound also projected onto the wall and just the surrounding this really amazing and very bewitching performance um, that was going on and nobody had any idea what it was about until the lights went on and the person with the headset stood up and then the team came out and explained basically what was going on and 
um, because of that interaction, yeah, the performers were also able to discuss the limitations of this like, current commercial uh, EEG and people were interfacing with the data and data collection and, um, and sort of deep, deepening that understanding of that. And I think actually, you know, people were asking a lot of questions and the more they asked the questions, because not all of them were neuroscientists, they were, they, I think people were getting more confused and a little bit betrayed, maybe like, well, this is how an EEG works and this is what, um, but I think confusion is good. Confusion is, is meaning that you're being challenged and I think questions lead to more questions. and. Um, and, and that's what we like, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so yeah, leaving BCI behind. There's, I mean, as I said, there's so much going on, and hopefully we'll be doing workshops with sort of flying drones with this, this uh, uh, BCI technology EEG in the future. Not, I mean, loads happening, lots to get involved with. Um, yeah. So moving on to a different data collection type, I guess. Uh, no data collection is perhaps more of more full of challenges in explaining the results than fMRI. <laughs> fMRI, in my opinion. Um, and so this is a piece by Russell Hodge, uh, who is the MDC science communicator in, in residence, I believe. And he did this piece called Ghosts in the Brain. And it was a project for colorizing fMRI images in different schemes to see if different features of the data would be noticeable to scientists. They, it was, they were. And the idea of ghosts is that we have these hidden assumptions haunting our language and our standard settings and data analysis and visualizations and that we do inherit shortcomings potentially or thought patterns because of this hierarchical structure of the lab sometimes. And I really like that, you know, what we've discovered is art and science is really has the possibility to be a critical commentary about our default settings as scientists as well and and talking with artists they ask the poking questions and I think that's really really important and for um, increasing sort of the efficacy of of our work um, and I think it's incredibly relevant um, yeah so staying on the theme of reflexivity in science how are we doing? I want to jump to our next data point, um, which is epidemiology. And Sarah Simula in 2019 did this lovely piece called uh, Layers of Reality. And it was a piece to take into consideration the rich and personal individualized experience of mental health and specifically schizophrenia in different uh, cultures as well, because um, you know people are differentially affected by schizophrenia. The, the symptoms are different in different parts of the world, even though it's under the same um, diagnosis basically and so she was just sort of raising awareness at the very um, the many layers that you could literally physically flip through this is the artist here on the left on the right um, and it was, people were really enjoying interacting with that and I think it's really important because you know you have the neuroscience side you have the psychiatric side you have the personal and cultural side and you know does neuroscience really take into account all of our layers and on this last piece, you almost made it through to, to the end. I wanted to talk about, um, yeah, qualitative patient accounts. And um, Robin and Ben did this awesome 3D immersive sound experience of a panic attack um, based on patient accounts. And, you know, so much of art is about qualia, like how did it feel? And when it comes to pain and suffering, you know, metaphor, you know, it's like a weight. It's like a, is still... The, one of the, you know, it's our go-to way of explaining how we are feeling in these in these times, apart from scales, which you know, come with a lot of other problems. So pieces like this, which you know, it's, it's very sensitive data, but it br does bridge the gap and allows for people to feel less isolated in their experience. You know, we do welcome the neurodiverse, and we do want to be able to, um, yeah share it in a, in a sensitive way. It's worth mentioning though that in 2018 in the exhibition when this was put on uh, it was in the basement in a tiny room at the back and I didn't try it because it was apparently very realistic <laughs> but um, if you're interested in 3D sound experiences we have another one uh, on Thursday to do with uh, sound meditation and chanting. So you made it through all of the examples. Just one more point before we go into our breakout rooms. I think just going meta on uh, creativity and neuroscience data. Um, yeah, I think that uh, there is the possibility to, yeah, also have this as a citizen science project as well and, and, and gather information, what are people interested in? And um, you know, neuroaesthetics is the, which Coco, one of the core organizers of EDGE is doing her PhD on at Vienna 
it's the data collectible from installation art. So in the future, we'd like to also be able to collect information on, on, on the exhibitions themselves as well. And we're hopefully digitalizing our exhibitions more in the future with potentially augmented reality. Um, I think it's going to be really important for our changing environment and the climate of the, the art scene and the sciences and how we interact. I think augmented reality is going to play a role and it's something that we're interested in. So if we have time now, I'd like to instigate a creative meetup and I'll just introduce the questions that I'd like to discuss and then I'll see if we can do breakout rooms. Um, yeah, so we've seen a lot now, got through a lot of different um, data collection points. And um, yeah, I think I wanted to ask in these breakout rooms, we'll get into groups of three uh, just for 10 minutes or so. You know, this is actually a very important part of our workshops. Every time we have what we call speed meeting and it always comes out with interesting collaborations. You never know like who you're going to meet. So hopefully we can recreate that a little bit. And yeah, I just wanted to talk about, you know, of all of the pieces that I mentioned, of the things that I talked about, what spoke to you and, and why. Um, and then, you know, science is an emotional and passionate labor, I think. And so let's discuss our mentors, our techniques, our motivations. And then um, this is the most important question, if you only have time for this one, you know, what ideas do you now have for your data? You know, maybe you're gonna codify this behavioral scoring and make a house track out of it. I don't know. We'll just see what happens. It can be silly. Hopefully it's silly. That's, that's really, play is a very important part of this. So maybe I can stop sharing now and go. Um, you spend so much time without the, the, the videos on. It's going to be interesting. So let's see, breakout rooms. How's everyone doing? Is everybody still there? <laughs> yes, so we're here. Oh, with you. Very nice. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, the recording, so I'll probably just stop it now. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah.